10,000 years ago, the last ice age turned Northern Europe into a polar region. In the remote highlands of Scotland, its legacy was a narrow trench of inky water 40 kilometers long that slashed a great diagonal scar across the rugged terrain. Loch Ness is a haunting place. Sheer mountains and murky depths reflect its many moods. It holds more water than any other lake in Britain, but has been famous since the sixth century for a legendary monster, which over 3,000 people claim to have seen. Few scientists have dared to risk their reputations in serious study of the loch, worried they'd be labeled monster hunters. But now science has overcome its shyness. Dr. Glenn George, with other leading scientists from the Freshwater Biological Association, is part of a bold venture to explore this immense volume of water. He believes the featureless surface hides a complex underwater world, which behaves like two different lakes on top of each other. A warmer layer where little lives over a deep, dark, cold underworld with unknown communities and wild underwater weather. The seagoing Callanus, a 65-foot scientific research vessel, will be this team's home and workplace for the next month. Most freshwater lakes are cut off from the sea, but Loch Ness is different. A canal links it to the Atlantic Ocean. It's of great significance to the scientists who can bring this large boat to the loch, and with it, deep sea equipment and techniques. They want to find out how Loch Ness works by examining what lives in both warm and cold waters and where these organisms get their food. They hope to build a picture of the loch's food chain, but their findings are also needed for a worldwide study about environmental change. This remote location, lack of agriculture and difficult terrain have kept the loch virginal for thousands of years. It's a deep water lake in almost pristine condition, and that's why it's important to a team from Britain's Natural History Museum. They're investigating global pollution and how to identify environments at risk. Information from Loch Ness will be their baseline, a critical piece in a scientific jigsaw. Actually, we've come to Loch Ness because it's one of the most interesting pieces of fresh water in the United Kingdom. It's the largest body of fresh water in the United Kingdom. Indeed, there is as much water there as all the water in England and Wales put together. And that makes it absolutely unique. One of the things that's unique about it is the great depth here. The sides of the basin plunge away right down to 210 metres. Now, when you consider that a normal lake is only 20 metres deep, 210 metres, just a couple of hundred metres offshore, is absolutely fabulous. The loch bed is home for microscopic worms called nematodes that the team will be hunting. It's virtually undisturbed, and if there were pollution, this is where it would settle, hundreds of meters below surface in waters almost deep enough to swallow the Eiffel Tower. Dr. Lambshead and his team are at the cutting edge of their science. The Natural History Museum is famed as a tourist attraction, but is driven by hard-headed science, and sometimes myth can have value. Nessie 
in a way is quite useful to us because people get attracted to Loch Ness because of Nessie and hopefully although Nessie draws them in they'll actually get attracted to the real monsters that are in the loch. They're very tiny and they're very important and they're called nematodes. Nematodes are microscopic worms found everywhere from the highest mountain to the deepest sea. Many of them are parasites like roundworms but their importance to this expedition is that they're sensitive to pollution but not destroyed by it. Communities of nematodes adapt. If their environment becomes polluted, some species of the worm disappear and others take their place. Discovering which ones live at the bottom of a pristine lake will give science a starting point of purity to work from when trying to assess pollution. Just at this point here, we've got the central plateau separating the northern basin from the okay. southern basin. How deep is that? Yes, that's about about 150 metres. Still pretty deep it's, then. Yes, oh, it's quite good. We can then move up into the northern basin, which is considerably deeper. You go down to 200 metres. And if we have time, we can move along, we we'll go further north up to Urquhart Castle. Urquhart Castle lies on the northern side of the loch, the scene of many sightings and this photograph, taken in 1955 by bank manager Peter McNabb. A black undulating, or rather a dark-coloured, undulating creature, a live creature. I lifted the camera, took this shot, which was naturally rather hazy, because I had to hold this long-focus camera. There's camera shake, excitement, and all the rest. In the picture is the tower of Urquhart Castle. I understand it's a 40-feet-high tower, which gives an excellent impression of the overall length of the monster. It's been estimated at between loosely 30 and 40 feet. Before I could get a second shot, it was gone. Of all the monsters reported around the world, Nessie often seems closest to discovery. But could the sighting simply be misinterpretations of natural phenomena? Dr. Susan Blackmore is a psychologist. Her expertise is visual perception, and she's often called on to examine claims of strange sightings. Most people have heard of the monster, and Dr. Blackmore believes this could affect how they look at the lock. As a visitor for the first time seeing that lock, I found it a menacing place. The water's cold and dark, the mountains are around the outside. It's, it, it is a frightening place. And it's possible, I think, that people have dealt with that menace by putting it into a monster. It wouldn't surprise me at all if people take quite a long time to get used to that water, and until they are used to it, they may well see things that they think are monsters, which later on, if they'd seen them, they would realize were just the normal behavior of the waves in Loch Ness. As our camera crew traveled back from filming on the loch, they spotted something remarkable. A huge form was breaking the water in front of them. But this sighting was not of a living creature, it was a tremendous wave in otherwise calm waters. To get to actually to work here as a scientist is very exciting. There's been very little done in the loch, but now we want to have a good look at what makes Loch Ness tick. Dr. Colin Bean is the fish expert on board the Callinus. He's here to trawl for fish at different depths to find out what they are and how they survive. The distribution of fish and their numbers are influenced by the food available and the threat of being eaten themselves. So information from the trawls may give clues about whether larger predators could exist. It's not every day we get funds to go and do something we love doing and an environment that is virtually unexplored by science. This was the size of the task ahead of him. Dr. Bean expects to find mostly Arctic char, which belong to the salmon family. They were one of the first colonizers of northern lakes after the Ice Age. Up on the night, eh? What have you got, Colin? Do you know we've caught, lads? 
Brown, lightest brown, black, greenish colour. Slimy, solid, and very strange. There's a big wake behind it, and it moved at this angle with a wake two feet of high behind it, and then it went down, and the water surged up, and that was it. And I couldn't, very difficult on Loch Ness, it's very um, difficult to measure the size of these things. Luckily, on that same day, exactly in the same spot, I saw one of the swans swimming on that point, and the swan was only two feet high. It was more than twice to three times higher, taller than the swan. The thickness of the neck was thick as your thigh, but three times again thicker than the swan's neck. And so altogether it was about seven feet high. It's a tiny head. It was, you could just see it, but it was just basically a long, thin neck getting thicker at the bottom and a small head. But I couldn't see anything else on it. We know that when people look at patches of water, it is very, very difficult to know how far away something is or what it is you're seeing. For example, if we haven't got much information, then we have to judge size by apparent distance or distance by apparent size. And this is precisely the situation we have at Loch Ness. Scientist Diane Hewitt is pragmatic about the monster. She's responsible for equipment that will help to map an unexplored underwater world. She tolerates Nessie for the sake of her science. Well, I suppose the bottom line is if it wasn't for the Nessie legend, there'd be no interest in the lake and we wouldn't have been able to come up here and work. There is no way in Britain today a scientist would be able to put together a programme like this out of the kind of normal funding. It's got to be special funding. And if special funding is built on the back of the Nessie legend, but the outcome is good science, fine, you know, go for it. The team are interested in plankton, small organisms that drift in the water and provide food for the fish. Working round the clock, they want to chart the movement and location of these plankton to throw light on the loch's ecosystem and its food chain, and ultimately help them understand long-term environmental change. Our work at Loch Ness really supplies one piece in a very large jigsaw. So the work at Loch Ness is a very small part of what is really a very challenging task, to understand our past and to predict what changes we may expect in coming decades. An instrument fitted with a range of sensors was used to collect samples. The scientists were curious about a layer of organisms that ran the length of the log. This so-called scattering layer was suspended in the warmer water about 30 meters down. Precise records were kept of where and when each sample was taken, the skipper recording an exact log of the ship's position so the distribution of plankton could be plotted. The hours on board were long and arduous, not least for John the Cook, who provided constant hot meals to fuel the expedition. Each time the plankton recorder was hauled from the depths, it brought on board another long roll of gauze which had trapped samples from the loch. Almost like a roll of film captures images from moments in time. Once you start looking at it and once you start really analysing it, always you get more questions, you know, why? You know, why not this? Why not that? And then you answer that one and you go a level deeper and something else pops up. There's always another mystery underneath. Diane's first finding surprised her. The scattering layer turned out to be largely made up of a type of midge larva that spends most of its life in the mud. Mud 
which was up to 200 meters below where the larvae were found. It was a finding the scientists cannot yet explain on one clue that Loch Ness was not going to behave as expected. Did you hear about the The secrets of Loch Ness were pulling together leading scientists from three important disciplines. The pursuit of scientific truth was about to shed more light on the loch's gloomy underwater world and its inhabitants. Just 10 meters down, Loch Ness is pitch dark. The scientists are working blind, so they use the sensitive ears of sonar to scan the depths. Its main use is to determine the size and movement of fish in the loch. meters and uh, I totally lost him he was he couldn't have been more than six feet away from me couldn't see him couldn't see my hand in front of my face couldn't see my dials it's like going into a black hole you know it was really scary not a very pleasant experience at all not one I intend to repeat if we look up in the top right hand corner of the screen here we find this large red mass this is actually a diver that is swimming underneath the transducer at this very moment in time the diver is very large and red, which indicates a very strong signal. The fish, by comparison, are very small and blue. It's a very weak signal return. Sonar sends out ultrasonic waves, which are reflected back by objects underwater. You don't get a feel for the actual size of the loch just by looking across from shore to shore. You don't get an appreciation of the depth of the loch. It's extremely dark below 15 metres. You get no way of knowing what's going on below the surface. You could actually hide a herd of elephants in there and never come across them with the sonar. The pencil beam of sonar can sample only narrow sections of the loch. Interpretation is difficult, and false echoes can be generated. A previous sonar survey uncovered strangely regular readings on the loch bed. They've been dubbed the footprints, and it's thought they could be connected to wartime military exercises of the loch. The scientists were not officially researching the footprints, but they were curious. So just as they'd used sonar to listen, they now sent the sea owl to look. The owl makes its dive, searching out its prey. Powerful lights and onboard cameras offering rarely seen views of the loch's inky depths. The location of one of the sonar readings was targeted. Then came the moment of discovery. An anticlimax. The footprint appeared to be a wheelbarrow. But could all the other footprints really be the same? The scientists could only speculate. 
and the lock bed reclaimed its mystery. The lock bed and its secrets are also the target for the natural history team. They want samples of mud and with it the nematode worms that live there. The lock's peaty depths have lain almost undisturbed for thousands of years. The deep sediment, a natural history archive trapping information from the past. If we were to imagine all the animals of the world lined up in a traffic jam, then the first three quarters 75% of all the animals would be nematodes. The other 25% would be mostly beetles, and then there'd be a few unimportant things like human beings and chickens following up the rear. In the sea, there can be 10 to 20 million nematodes in a square meter of mud. Such enormous numbers are of value to the scientists for statistical analysis, because the larger the sample, the more accurate the result. Steve suggested this method. Yeah. You know, there's not much sand in this. Mm -hmm. See it's on. The information from Loch Ness will be used for the next 20 or 30 years by scientists all around the world who will supply with the data, who will use it in their mathematical models to try and predict the effects of climatic change and pollution. For that reason, this is going to be a very exciting project. Just a sad man. Fish are really the only things I'm interested in, and uh, whether they're alive or whether they're dead, I don't really matter. I don't really care. I think, obviously, anyone that's interested in fish would rather catch them in a lima rather than a big net. But um, from a professional point of view, there's obviously much more information to be gathered by catching them by a net, and it's also a bit easier on the arms. where the average catch was somewhere around two or three fish. The catch of 20 fish in one haul was fairly huge. Uh, 
Very exciting and uh, most welcome at the time. These are all Arctic char. We've got a range of sizes here. Going from fish that we suspect here will be about a year old to rather large individuals like this one here, which could be anything up to three, four, maybe five years old. A lot of people think that Loch Ness Monster, if one exists, is a plesiosaur because some of the shapes that have been seen in the water appear to be humps with a long neck. And that, of course, is the nearest equivalent shape to a plesiosaur. Plesiosaurs were a group of marine reptiles. They lived in probably fairly shallow coastal waters. We know they were fish eaters and squid eaters. We don't know much about their family life or whether they lived in groups or herds. And we don't know much about the way they reproduced, but it's generally supposed that they probably came on shore to they lay their eggs, rather like modern turtles do today. head sticking, it was a good foot out of the water and it was very sort of square um, and I would say it was quite a dark brown and then it just went under, just completely disappeared. And the ripples just went right out the loch and then brought this waves in at a funny angle right up onto the shore and that's what made us just jump back. I know what I saw and it was a definite living creature in that water, absolutely couldn't have been anything else. I was running along the shore to try and keep up with it and just kept taking photographs as often as I could. I feel in some way a chosen person, almost confusing it with a religious sort of experience uh, because I feel that no one again will see what I saw, exactly where I saw it and when I saw it, obviously. I uh, feel very special. It makes you special. You're different from everybody else. You've seen it and they haven't. If the monster is there, what else might be there? The Tooth Fairy, Father Christmas. I mean, it's bringing up all these other things that we have to, as sensible adults, put to one side as fantasy. But here's one of them come true. That particular night, it was very calm, the lock. It was like a little pond. And there was no boat to be seen for miles. Well, whilst I was bathing the children that evening, I looked out of the window and saw a large week, some half a mile long. And I wondered what it was, because it wasn't like a boat week. Um, it was like something was protruding out of the water. It lasted for some 10, 15 minutes. I saw a big camp in the water and I said to my dad, look, there's the monster. James shouted, look, there's the monster. And obviously I didn't believe him at first, but when I looked round and looked out across the loch, which was quite clear at that point, although we were coming in towards trees, um, I could see this giraffe type neck coming out of the water, probably about six feet, six foot high, um, with a body coming off it very high out of the water as well, probably about 20. 20 odd feet, 20, 30 feet long, um, and a weight coming off it, going nice and slow, uh, brownish in colour, sort of tiki brown.
came up, um, went down, came up, went down, came up, uh, three times like that, in, in that sort of succession, up, up, up. And I uh, sort of leaned across, tapped Susan on the shoulder because she was actually uh, in the passenger seat, locked side of me. And I said, oh, um, you know, what's that? And uh, more or less by the time I'd done that, um, there was a sort of tremendous disturbance uh, in the in the water, in the direction whatever this thing was going, and it was there was nothing on the surface, but there was clearly something uh, very large and and sort of powerful uh, just under the surface, and then you're looking at it, and suddenly you think, well, you know, crikey, that's the Loch Ness monster, you know, and then it just it came heaving out of the water, and it was like um, it was like watching a, a whale. I was most reluctant to look. I'd been reading and I thought, what the hell is he on about, you know? So I sort of gave a cursory look. And then Alistair actually physically pushed me out of the car. And then actually when I was out standing on the, the lay-by, I actually saw the back static, uh, just motionless, just you know, right in the middle of the, the water. And immediately, your mind doesn't accept what you see. Um, it goes through your head, what could it be? And my mind didn't automatically think, oh, it's the Loch Ness Monster at all. I was trying to get some rational explanation for what I actually saw there. When you actually come up here and are confronted with the reality of the place and you see what a, a spectacular setting it is for a monster myth with the ruined castle, high mountains, this mysterious dark water, and then very soon I think the scepticism starts to bite and you think, well, really, you know, for heaven's sake, this is the ideal place for this monster myth to develop and all they've been seeing is boat wakes and birds and all the rest. But, I mean, the thing that... That, that we saw was just quite clearly none of those, you know. Having seen this thing and proved to my own satisfaction that there was truth behind this Nessie legend, it did change my life, I have to say. People are very certain about things that they should not really be certain about because that's what happens as people tell and retell accounts. You don't remember how things actually appeared to you at the time. You remember the way your brain has saved an economical version of it. And then you go on and tell that and it becomes more clear, precise, and with a great deal of certainty as time goes on. It sounds such an exciting thing, oh, you go looking for Nessie, but actually when people, if anybody sits down and does it for longer than five minutes, they realise what a absolutely mind-numbingly boring thing it is. I mean, anybody who says it's, it's interesting sitting for 4,000 hours looking for the Loch Ness Monster, they aren't doing it properly. You know, it isn't. It's very, very dull. It's tedious in the extreme.
to actually see something unfold in front of you that you've only seen line drawings of, that very few people have actually seen. Obviously it was a wonderment for both myself and for Lynn. Unfortunately, we never got it in the dimer point and so on. We've had it in the back scan and stuff. Well, that's an even stronger target. I've been mean, yeah. trailing a very distinct way. Yeah, it is, yeah. They've been travelling at a fair enough speed, I think. There's an indication on here that there were two, two targets together. Yeah. You see, there's, there's another V coming behind. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a, an indication that there may be another target here. Yeah, well, funnily enough, there's one here. Well, from the, the sonar trace that we got, we had an extremely hard hit followed by a quite pronounced wake. Obviously, I, I, th I thought it may well have been a fish, but fish don't have wakes. It's something unusual. Uh, neither of us can explain exactly what it is. Here is the most unusual film of recent years, for it proves the existence of a monster in nest. Climatic conditions and exposure day and night to bleak and stormy weather affected our film, which accounts for the misty result. But this is unimportant in comparison to the achievement of filming the monster itself for the first time in history. Like a black anaconda, that's what it looked like. Came out of the water like that, and then it went down, and there was a boil of white foam. And then it broke surface once again with a boil and went on. I didn't see it again. One thing I did notice, behind the object, there appeared to be a shadow, which wasn't obvious from the positive image. One technique I used was by overlaying a number of frames and thereby enhancing the real information. And the shadow now became a distinct shape. Before I saw the film, I thought the Loch Ness Monster was a load of rubbish. Having done the enhancement, I'm not so sure. I don't think it's at all likely that there's a plesiosaur living in Loch Ness. Loch Ness has only existed for the last 10,000 years, since the last Ice Age and the last plesiosaurs died out about 70 million years ago. So we've got an awfully long gap. They say that a woman's best experience in the world is obviously having their first baby, which yes, but the emotions for seeing something like this as well is just so overwhelming. I can't, yeah, I can't decide which one was the best. Almost all the witnesses I talked to said that it, it was a dramatic event and, and in some way changed their lives. I mean, Edna in particular said that it was as, as, as important to her emotionally as having her first baby. That may seem odd, but I think when you realise that it's touching on a kind of sort of mythic realm, if you like, all the strange things that, that, that one might fantasise about, and you've seen one of them, I think it, it's perhaps understandable. Hearing all these stories reminded me of the determination of the human mind, always to seek explanations. We don't like to see something or even remember something without giving it a label. And in a place like this, if you see something formless and dark floating in the loch, it's going to be the Loch Ness Monster.
What's important is the 60 to 80 million scientific specimens that we store here. These specimens are from all around the world. They're absolutely vital for modern biology because they bring order to biology, just like the periodic table of elements brought order to chemistry. We've only looked at a few hundred animals so far from the lock, but already we've found 23 different types of nematode there, and one of them seems to be a completely new species. That is, it's never been discovered before anywhere in the world.